PhD student at MIT, and he has worked previously at Meta, Apple, Amazon, Motorola, and several startups. His research focuses on distributed computation and statistics and machine learning under the constraints of privacy and efficiency. Uh, he won the Meta PhD research fellowship in applied statistics, the social and ethical responsibilities of computing uh, award twice, numerous press paper, paper, uh, and numerous press paper awards. Thanks, it was a really nice workshop. Um, so the, the viewpoint I take in the start is uh, uh, basically coming from the fact that the DP has been around for about a decade and crypto has been around for longer. Uh, so the crux of these problems have been very deeply studied, uh, the foundations of DP, so there are books on these topics. Uh, what I find, um, even by the time I started my PhD, what I find is uh, still a bit of an open space for exploration for newcomers like me, when I was a newcomer, I still consider my sense to be a newcomer, and as well as like, uh, experts in the field, is, uh, is intersections between other interesting topics. Um, for example, Mike was talking about uh, some fields being at the intersection of game theory and uh, computer science and econ and computer science. So there are some other subfields of nice broad interest, uh, which open up interesting problems when you kind of put distributed or private around it. Uh, okay. Um, this slide needs no introduction, given the group that we are. So I just color coded something. Uh, how is this incentivized? We are trying to figure out how do we enable uh, data sharing across different levels. It could be at the individual level. It could be at the organizational level. Um, and then we have issues of privacy. There's also issues of efficiency. So, so that's, that's that. I won't spend more time on this. There's also notions for different topologies and so on and so forth. Uh, this is the uh, sort of a, a smaller mind map uh, of the kind of intersections between privacy and distributed computation and other problems. And it opens up interesting problems. I won't go through each circle here. For example, partial differential equations in privacy, what's the connection? There is some work on the fact that you can solve some classical um, PDEs, like the iconal equation, with some uh, variable privacy inputs that the people are asking for to release heat maps. And this gives rise to a, a notion of privacy called Lipschitz privacy. But then epsilon Lipschitz privacy has been proven to be equivalent to dip, uh, DP. Uh, and the conversion is alpha epsilon, where alpha is just saying, what is the max um, separation you can have between your data points? So you have some separation bound, some sort of packing kind of bound. And that's a conversion. So that's an interesting fact. Um, there some of these maybe you could already recognize, some are kind of new. So it's worth kind of understanding. For example, in statistics, there's a question, so how do you measure correlations? There's point estimates. How do you do hypothesis testing? There's interesting problems whenever you put in a, a, a very uh, solid discipline uh, with, with the privacy problems. So the first problem is motivated by initially by some applied work that uh, I did early on uh, on what is called split learning. Uh, let's call it a variant of federated learning. Uh, but the privacy question is um, the, also coming from the fact that there's a lot of applied conferences like CVPR and so on and so forth, like applied ML, where there's a lot of um, black box encoders and you know, adversarial uh, training uh, models and a lot of empirical attacks. Some of them, for example, Solomon was showing, kind of saying this is higher, kind of like a heuristically, uh, some sort of a privacy model, but we're not sure if it's formally private. But then there are these people training these amazing, really large models, a lot of deployment effort is going in. What can we do taking this off the shelf, uh, informally private model to make it formally private? What can you do? What kind of problems can we solve there? So there's a little more detail. So you have worst case privacy guarantees if you did formal kind of uh, uh, privacy mechanisms. Um, I guess the usually poor trade-off is a little bit of an overstatement, but I'm uh, referring to the fact there is a trade-off and in some problems it's certainly poor. Um, there's a data-driven approach, which are these applied ML uh, models which have informal privacy. Uh, it's not called a guarantee, but evidence, maybe database evidence showing maybe there's some informal privacy. So our work is trying to bridge this in the initial project. So with some pictures, there's a, well, so many papers, I guess you could count hundreds of papers maybe at, uh, at this point, which fall in this kind of a, uh, without the privacy aspect, this kind of a setup. So there is an encoder, which is learning some sort of a embedding or some sort of a representation of the data set. Um, there is some informal privacy obfuscator, which is kind of tweaking these uh, uh, representations. And then, uh, that's where we plug in our post hoc privacy framework. We're calling it post hoc because it's happening after the fact. Uh, this is where we, uh, we introduce some formal privacy guarantees. 
Um, and then the way the scheme works on the learning side is uh, instead of uh, reconstructing the, the original image uh, in an obfuscated form from the obfuscated representation, it would be after the post hoc privacy has been uh, implemented, it would reconstruct the image. But then we need to take some applied input as well, because when you add noise to representations, your representation needs to be reasonable so that you, you reconstruct a reasonable image purely from an applied perspective. But this has been very well studied in uh, different fields, like various land coders and blah, blah, blah. These are called latent space perturbations on the applied side. So this is pan-disciplinary even across theory and uh, privacy. You can also uh, theory and applied. So there are some inputs we can, outputs we can take in the applied uh, field as well. And then you do the prediction network. So this is the, the fact, uh, for example, this is the applied input that we're taking before we go into the theoretical slides. So maybe the face, uh, the faces would be more interesting. So these perturbations of these famous people apparently is, uh, uh, causing that you can see this guy being converted into another face. You see, it's not like some random image that you're generating after you perturb. So there is room for adding noise. The question is, how do you add formal privacy giving noise to the, to the embedding representation? Because the ML part is kind of robust in that sense. Like you're not gonna go to some other image. You can convert this person to a completely different race, completely different image, depending on how much perturbation you're doing. So the networks are robust from a deeper perspective. So now let's use all these inputs to solve the, the problem that we were uh, posing. So uh, it's also good to know what are the impossibility results in here, because when we're talking about, uh, this is also in the prediction setting, we're not talking about training, so private prediction in the setting. So there are some impossible results by Nicholas Carlini. This came out after some controversial paper called the DP, uh, the Insta hide uh, that came out, which also had some very nice, uh, uh, nice things to take from it. From uh, Of course, there was some a lot of controversy around it. So the Carlini paper basically said, you cannot give privacy from like an instant by instance to instance basis because you're asking for uh, any two inputs to give you some output that would always be indistinguishable. That's too much to ask for um, uh, from a DP kind of a definition perspective. So we don't want to do that. There's, if you're going towards that, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot, foot uh, on the formal side. So, uh, so the thing we take up uh, as an inspiration is the metric DP, which is actually in some, maybe to me, it seems like it's a, uh, inspired from what is known as group privacy. So this is basically in the DP definition, it's modifying the definition of neighborhood uh, from being uh, typically used as a having distance, which is what people consider as neighboring uh, databases uh, to uh, something that is, uh, uh, let's call it some sort of a neighborhood ball. We are kind of restricting ourselves to our neighborhood ball uh, as to what we consider as uh, uh, neighboring. And then we're also, and the metric DP also generalizes to a different metric. It doesn't have to be having. Uh, so you're now thinking from a metric space. Uh, it could be L1, L2, but it could be some sort of a nice Riemannian metric if you want to, for example. Uh, and there's another, th uh, now, what are the, th the theoretical inputs of existing work, apart from the impossibility result on the positive side that we can build upon? This is existing dwarf stock since 2009, so that literally since a decade, decade of more, more than a decade. So there is a, what, typically the initial results in DP, as you guys are aware of, are about the global sensitivity as to how you calibrate the noise, the initial levels. And that ensures DP when you use like a nice distribution with respect to the tails that look like Laplace, for example. Uh, but then the question is, um, people can, were having a hard time estimating global sensitivity for all sorts of queries once you're making the queries a little more complicated than like a mean or median release. And then came the idea of a local sensitivity, which is basically the global sensitivity is measuring for any query what is the maximum difference the query could change if your inputs were not changing much, which is kind of an instantiation of the de DP definition in itself. But the local sensitivity is kind of dependent on not just the query, but at a point at a time. So it's an evaluation of how the query is changing around a given point. So that's for the local sensitivity. But the problem is local sensitivity, when you add noise calibrated to it, it does not guarantee a DP definition. It doesn't give DP guarantee, not all the time. That's when this very novel framework called the proposed test release was, uh, um, was kind of uh, invented, discovered, put together. So in here, what they say is, you first propose a bound on the local sensitivity. So that's the first line, the beta. And then the test part kind of says, is your bound good enough? That if you consider this as your local sensitivity, would it guarantee DP for sure, uh, with, without, any, uh, without any exceptions? If not, it will say it will not return anything. So it would just say, okay, no, that's a bad bound, try it again. So that's the proposed test release. There's a way of converting an informal local sensitivity into a formal notion of how you calibrate noise. Uh, so that's the inspiration. So the, what our thought process is for the problem I showed in the previous slides, how can we modify the proposed test release approach uh, for, the, for the kind of DP I'm looking for? Um, 
it's also the, the release part has this very interesting uh, 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 yes or no uh, gates. This is where the release is decided. And why is this weird and weird uh, quantity the way it is? That's because uh, the way it works is once you propose a bound, it tries to find an exception where the bound would fail in terms of the local sensitivity. That's the, the test part. And that ends up being a special case of like a counting query. And then counting queries have been kind of uh, studied, for example, even the Gautam Thomas differential privacy nodes, it became popular during the COVID period. Uh, I guess there are a lot of YouTube videos also alludes to this, uh, which is the, the error that you cannot control for. Uh, so that's, if you're up to that error, you're okay, that is okay, but beyond that is bad. So that's how they decide the gate, the release gate. Uh, okay. So uh, since we're now thinking about metric DP, um, the notion of local sensitivity in metric DP has the, the denominator not being one anymore. Uh, when you compute the local sensitivity or the Lipschitz constant, you have this denominator that depends on your choice of norms. Uh, but it's good to know a fact, the smiley fact, which is uh, if, you had, if you could estimate the local Lipschitz constant of your neural network, if you could do that, that is always going to be an upper bound in the local sensitivity at any like point twice at any given point of evaluation. But estimating for today's large world neural networks, the local Lipschitz constant is a problem in itself. But if you had ReLU networks, there's a recent uh, uh, paper by uh, Alex Demarcus and his uh, Matt Jordan, I believe, his uh, group member in Europe 2020, which guarantees a, a, a solid uh, estimate of the local Lipschitz constant. Uh, and this is a kind of a guaranteed estimate as opposed to like a guess. Uh, so you could always go with it um, and for like the relu networks basically so so what is our proposal for post hoc privacy is to build on proposed test release but this is a modified proposed test release where what we do is uh, we start with the proposed uh, uh, bound on the local sensitivity instead of because it's a proposed test release you first start with the bound and then you need to verify and then uh, we, we kind of uh, give some theorems on how you can narrow down onto what is a reasonable bound that is good enough to go with for, for the release in the metric DP framework. Uh, and then it, it, it is, it, we also estimate the local Lipschitz constant um, using the, the DeMarcus solver, uh, the, the one in Europe's paper. And then based on that, we kind of narrowed down our neighborhood as to what is a reasonable uh, bound to release with this. The initial estimate may not be good enough, but we narrow it down to an estimate which is good enough to go with once we get to the release step. Uh, this guarantees the metric DP definition that I was showing you. So this is a post hoc privacy framework. And it's good that the networks and ML has developed so well that when you add noise in the representation space with this kind of a setup, you get formal privacy, but you also get real looking images, which are kind of modified in the way you want. Um, so now, what is the other variant of uh, federated learning, the split learning where post hoc is a reasonable uh, way to formalize uh, privacy guarantees? Um, so we are all are aware of federated learning, it's super popular, so it's all about releasing weights. So it makes more sense in alignment with DP because DP is more about uh, privatizing the coefficients of the model as opposed to privatizing uh, like an instance based or like some notion of one instance kind of a privacy. Uh, but we introduced just purely from a distributed side of the thing, because the talk is not only privacy, there's some distributed side of the benefits, which is the resource and communication efficiencies that you would get uh, if you were able to do something with it, uh, especially in a world where we have in the cross device setting, especially there are these really large number of uh, edge devices with resource constraints. So what could we do? These are simple Lego block kind of, kind of ideas, right? So what we did is uh, uh, known as split learning, where we don't want the whole network to be trained on each client because that's too, too uh, resource intensive for each client, but we kind of split the network. Uh, but this comes at a cost, which you'll see on the privacy aspect, which is, but it also comes at a huge benefit. The huge benefit is you're only sharing the activations of one layer, not the entire thing, but just one layer. It's a minute, minute proportion as opposed to sharing this large gigabyte of model up and down your device, or even asking it to be trained before you share it on the device. So that's a split learning approach and it trains fine. We did a lot of split learning variants, again, with the heuristic or the applied kind of spirit where we tried uh, what some re-engineering of things and seeing what, what improves the split learning communication and computation trade-off further. But I don't want to go into these nitty-gritty details of the other variants, but I encourage you to look into it. But this is the overall idea. Um, and then there is some notion of topologies. This is really like Lego blocks at this point. You could do different kind of topologies, vertical partitioning, horizontal partitioning. Um, 
you could have a case where uh, you split it into a U shaped where both the label and input data is at the client. You don't release either of them in the raw form, only the middle part is with the server, et cetera. There's a, and there could be other things. There could be something hard that you could do, multi blah, blah, blah. Uh, we did some real world experiments, but there's a one version of our uh, engineering trials where, uh, okay, that's when you take the wrong turn on the road. Okay, so there's one version of the engineering trials where uh, we noticed the, a much bigger improvement in the communication and uh, um, the compute trade off, the bandwidth and compute trade offs, which is uh, what we call adaptive split learning. But this honestly was inspired by a lot of theoretical work on the optimization group that you guys were talking in terms of the local training work in FL. So basically this is sort of like local training for, uh, for SL. And it's also a call for the, the theory folk that do optimization in specific to try to come up with nice convergence results and understand the trade-offs in the setting. Uh, but if you do local training in SL, SL itself is reducing the communication bandwidth a lot. But now if you're only doing local training of the client and sharing just one layer of activations, which is a very small payload, but you're doing that only once in a while. Um, and when you do it once in a while, you also synchronize with the server because you don't want these client and server networks to just do whatever they want. You know, they need to be synchronized because it's a sequence anyway. Um, there, for obvious reasons, you'd see like an even bigger uh, jump in the payload uh, as opposed to sharing gigabytes of models. Um, how much time do we have? Okay, so so okay, so that's that. Now let's jump to another. So this is the main part of the talk I wanted to share, but there's other results I'd like to allude to, which is other connections between distributed and private computation. So one other problem that is potentially of interest in the data market or the data valuation world, even before you go into mechanism design, is this notion of trying to even estimate correlations in the two-party setting, just uh, point estimates uh, of reasonably known estimates, but how do you do it in a private setting? Um, this is typically a hard problem if you were to do like an inner product, it was shown by Salil Wallen papers on the limits of two-party differential privacy. If you added noise on both sides and you want to do something like an inner product where each part uh, X is with one party and Y is with the other party, uh, it would give you a very bad uh, utility privacy trade-off. So we don't want to, again, go towards an impossibility result and trying to improve it. So what we suggest is a, a one-way local privacy, which is kind of like a central DP in a sense, but it's the only difference is that your data is vertically partitioned. So the, what it means is if you want to measure correlation between X and Y, maybe like a data buyer and a data seller, the, the X would uh, release some intermediate representation of its data, with the, uh, which is a local summary with DP guarantees. Then Y would continue some compute with it using its own Y data and the intermediate private release that it got. You would get the final answer to what the point estimate of the correlation is, but it would never reveal the answer. Because once it reveals, it's a problem for its own privacy of the Y's data. But it could make a decision based on it in the data seller, data buyer kind of situation, for example, because uh, the data seller is the decision maker. Uh, but it, he doesn't need to release why or at what estimate he made the decision. Is it a good correlation back for you? It's not like releasing your grades to everyone just like it. Uh, and there's also a root problem. It's good to work on root or primitive problems because if you solve a downstream problem, it helps a lot of other things. And correlation has been around since Pearson. So uh, there's many kinds of measures of correlation. So many things depend on correlation. To allude to there are approaches for private, differentially private multi-party data, sorry, no, differentially private data synthesis uh, methods, which depend on, for example, copula models, which need to be initialized with the correlation matrix. But if your data is already siloed in a distributed setting, you can't even measure the correlation matrix privately. How would you even uh, initialize the Kafka model? You could do different things. You could do hypothesis testing of independence if you could measure correlations. There's a subfield of statistics called energy statistics, which are some nice measures of correlation. But the test statistic uh, has very nice asymptotic uh, distribution results, but it depends on uh, being able to be measured in a private way. Um, so what is the idea we suggest to uh, privatize nonlinear correlation estimates is uh, we, instead of, uh, we, we, ba we base our results on the properties of the JL lemma, the when you randomly project you preserve distances, but it also has implicit privacy properties uh, to give differential privacy. Uh, but it depends on what your downstream query is. So it's a reduction approach. If you're supposed to release pairwise distances after the projection, then you need to add noise, like literally additive noise. But if your downstream query was to measure covariances or some sort of a directional variance in some direction, uh, then you can just do a random projection. You don't need to add additive noise and you still have a DP guarantee. This is the implicit benefit of JL lemma, depending on the downstream query that you would like to do. 
So if you could release uh, private correlations and write it as a reduction uh, in terms of an, a function that depends solely on Laplacians or of the private data or of covariance of the private data, then you're done. You can just not add additive noise anymore and still have TP just from the random projection. Um, so that is exactly what we do. We take a measure of nonlinear correlation called distance correlation. Uh, it is an unbiased estimator. Its deviation is set up, studied, and so on and so forth. Um, and then what we do is uh, we, we take two approaches. First, first is we add, we do random projections. We add noise because the estimate truly depends on pairwise estimates of Euclidean distances. So you want to release distances, like I said, even after the random projection, you're supposed to add noise. So this was just like done as a starter effect to see how the uh, how the error bound varies. Um, uh, and and we were going to improve on the dependency on the error basically um, for the utility after this DP release. And then what we do is uh, utilize this uh, reduction I was talking about. We write down the distance correlation estimate uh, as uh, in two ways. One is as a function that depends on private Laplacians and function that depends on uh, some specific averages of pairwise distances as, as opposed to releasing individual estimates of pairwise distances because that's an open problem on the DP block to get like a sublinear error if you're releasing pairwise individual distances with like a graph DP guarantee. But if you want to do averages of it, you're fine. And then once you do the reduction, we can get a better <coughs> approach um, in terms of the additive and multiplicative errors. Um, and the middle term is our distance correlation, the ratio that you see, but then we show that the numerator and the denominator of ratio is a reduction. It only depends on Laplacians or directional variances of your, of your data. So there are individual bounds that exist. So the our theory ends up being, how do you combine the individual bounds in a way that you end up getting the final bound for the ratio? Um, so that's that. So these are the individual bounds for directional variances and covariances, uh, it's a reduction, and we get some, starting estimate of additive, or at least lower bound and upper bounds. So there is a lower bound. Now the question is, how can we start pushing the limits you know, on the dependencies? But this is a starting uh, approach for the private correlations. Uh, I end my talk with, uh, the, with, uh, with the final plug about a paper, because there was, I just put it, like I heard people were putting in slides about from theory to practice. There were slides of that sort. I put in this because there's a lot of incentive mechanism design, design uh, discussion yesterday and people were talking about fairness and trade-off of fairness uh, with respect to privacy. So there was at least one trade-off we formalized, um, at least with the classic mechanism of DP, which is uh, um, not just privacy, but DP from the perspective of randomized response. So the local DP randomized response, one of the earliest DP methods. What is the trade-off of your uh, flipping probability uh, in the randomized response in what is known as influence and welfare in social choice. Social choice is all about voting and aggregating votes and uh, majority is a, is a popular way to aggregate individual preferences. But then people also measure what is the influence of every single voter on the final aggregate of what the decision is. People measure what is the consensus or disconsensus between uh, sets of voters, which is notion of welfare. So when you, when you do probabilistic noise for randomized response, what you, what you can measure is known as a probabilistic notion of influence or like a probabilistic notion of welfare. And we get these trade-offs of if this is your flipping prob probability, how much would the influence reduce by or welfare reduce by? Uh, we give exact, the results come from, um, these are this is a more deeper and in terms of the theory, it come from like a discrete Fourier analysis, also known as analysis of Boolean functions. Um, we show that for um, influence, the proof is uh, a lot shorter. It used results from uh, analysis of Boolean functions. This book, Brian O'Donnell, is, a, is the only go-to book anyone talks about when you talk about the analysis of Boolean functions. But uh, there are also, so it kind of makes the proof super short, three, four lines. It's easier to analyze as opposed to using first probability principles. But sometimes the proof gets longer uh, in other cases where for your analysis looks a little tricky. Uh, but we, we give two kinds of proofs, how you do to the Fourier approach. And so it's kind of a lens of how do you formalize trade-offs between privacy and something else. So, so this is privacy, not just for privacy, but uh, for the sake of influencing uh, other, other notions that matter in social choice. Um, that's it. I think any questions, we're good. Oh, oh the important slide is uh, thanks to all the collaborators. Yeah. There's also a postdoc. Um, very effective. I've learned from, uh, sorry, not a postdoc, undergrad. I learned from an undergrad. He was a freshman. Uh, I learned more from him. Uh, he was very smart. He was an IMO gold medalist, but he was very effective. So 
especially want to emphasize his, uh, his contribution uh, to one of the projects. Any um, just, just, uh, yes. No, no, go ahead. Um, yeah, for uh, your um, uh, so differentially private measure of uh, correlation, so I wonder about uh, so the, the scalability of the approach. So, yeah. how many projections do you need to get a suitable estimate of the covariance, depending also on the complexity? Yeah, it's a good question. So initial distance correlation did not require random projections, and it was quadratic uh, complexity. It's not good because it's distances. Um, but then the random projection approach, um, empirically, like even 10 or 20 random projections were good enough because your data set is pretty big. Um, and your distance matrix has a lot of low rank information. That's probably one, one more intuitive reason why this is happening. Uh, but as far as the exact complexity goes, it's like KN log N. So, uh, it's a huge improvement uh, from n square. And uh, so in a, in a setup where the parties have to communicate through uh, like each other. And uh, so that's, I don't know exactly the details about the method, but is there a problem on the fact of that uh, perhaps there are several communication needs for? Uh, no, it's only one round of communication and only one way. So only Alice releases, so maybe like a date, potential data seller releases a private summary of its data that is then useful to be post-processed by a potential data buyer who gets the final correlation. There's only one communication one way. And the answer is never released in, but some dations are made. Just, just to back on that. So if you want to find a correlation between Alice and Bob, Alice just sends a one-way communication to Bob and the Bob is one who computes the private correlation. Right. Yeah, exactly. That is the yeah, it's a very primitive problem in that sense, like the upstream problem. Um, yeah, I agree. So even the mind map has different applications. Very good. Just plug in the private estimate, and you get further downstream private solutions without doing it. Maybe sometimes you have to prioritize some other terms that show up in the downstream problem, but at least one term is taken care of. Cool.